it got me through the hardest training, starting out broken. Mm. Where most people quit, I had just started. If we are consistently moving towards our edge and then getting there, we are growing, you know, because guess what we're doing at that point? It shouldn't be so much that you're crippled by it and unable to take action. You shouldn't be beating yourself into the ground because you're not everything you could be because no one is. And if you beat yourself into the ground, then you can't get up and improve. It's time to stop being lazy and start learning the discipline necessary to achieving the life you've always wanted. That's why in this video, I brought together some of the top Navy SEALs and other massively successful people to help you never be lazy again. Make sure to subscribe to this channel, drop a like, and leave a comment with your biggest takeaway below. What do you think of the skills that people should start to develop in their 20s in general to make them better human beings, more potentially uh, open to success financially, relationship, health-wise? What are two or three things that everyone should focus on in their 20s? Well, it certainly doesn't hurt to be in physical, good physical condition mm -hmm. so we can walk through it. Stop drinking too much. How do you know if you're drinking too much? Um, you regret what you do when you're drinking. It's, it's interfering with other important goals. Mm -hmm. it's, it's causing you financial distress. It's getting you in trouble with your friends or your family. It's getting you in trouble with the police. Okay, so stop abusing substances if you can, right? If you see that they're um, hurting you. Um, and alcohol is particularly pernicious in that regard. So physical health, are you in decent shape? Are you strong and coordinated? And if you're not, well, you'd be better if you were. <laughs> you'd feel better, you'd be more effective, you'd live longer, you'd be less sick. And you really see that mount up. Like if someone's been in shape once in their life, they age way better. Mm. And it's also a really good way of maintaining your cognitive ability. Like, you know, you, you hear about those exercises that you can do online to make you smarter and keep your cognitive ability intact. Yep. Those don't work. There's no evidence that they work. People keep saying that they make you smarter. They maintain your cognitive function. Psychologists have studied that for 50 years, hoping that one of those things will work. Mm -hmm. Trying all sorts of creative tacks. They don't work. Exercise works. Cardiovascular and weightlifting you start to decline in your fluid intelligence at about the age of 25. And it's a linear trend downhill and it can accelerate as you get older. It's mm. just like this, quite ugly. Mm. If you exercise, you stave that off. So that's really useful. Um, maintain your relationships and, and foster them. They're un so when I look at successful people, they're really good at something. They're reliable right? You can count on their word. They're generous mm -hmm. and they have a wide, wide connection network, which becomes more and more valuable as you get older. Yeah. So it's one advantage that older people really have over younger people. They have a connection network and a connection network is huge. Well, you could be connected to a thousand well-connected people. Okay. That means you are connected to the entire world. <laughs> Right, it's right. unbelievably valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's so absolutely remarkable about the situation that I'm in right now as far as one of the great benefits is I can, yeah. I can contact pretty much anybody and they'll talk to me. It's yeah. like, really? Right. That's so right. cool. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in infrastructure for reasons I won't get into, but I'm interested in infrastructure development. I think it's a good method of wealth transfer. It's a good solution to the problem of inequality and, and employment. Um, I reached out to a leading expert, a leading expert on infrastructure last week, to see if he'd talk to me. I thought, I don't know anything about infrastructure except that it's worn to a frazzle and we should do something about it. You know, he agreed to talk. And it, you, it, it, having a connection network is of an inestimable, inestimable value. It's huge. Um, Reliability, generosity, you can work on both of those. Philosophical sophistication, mm. it's very useful. 
um, because it orients you properly. You have a, a sophisticated sense of, of the world. You find, for example, that um, doing things for other people is actually more rewarding than virtually anything else you can do. Right. You know, when you hear you should be of service to other people. Well, if you actually watch yourself, you pay attention to yourself and you do something that helps someone else and it genuinely helps them. I defy you to find another experience that is that satisfying. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite stunning how satisfying that is. And so that's a very useful thing to realize. And why, and is, why is helping another person the most satisfying thing for probably most people when they're, if they're, you know, out of their ego of like, I want to buy more things to make me happy in this moment. Why is that such a satisfying thing for human beings? Uh, there's no better strategy for, there's no better life strategy. I mean, imagine, I could give you a, a quick sort of technical example. So imagine I take two people and I say, okay, um, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars and you have to give some of it to the person right beside you. And they can either agree or disagree with the split, but if they disagree, you don't get anything. Okay, so a classical economist would say that the person should take the hundred, offer the person next to them a dollar, and the person should accept it because why not? They get a dollar instead of nothing. And that's the solution. But what happens is that if you don't offer that other person something close to 50 50, they're it's likely to tell you. you to go to hell. Yes. Yeah. Very. And then, and then you, think, you get well, nothing. You get nothing too. You think, well, why would people do that? Because they just reject $50 and who cares? And the answer is, well, we don't just play one game with other people. We play a repeating game. And so, so imagine we did this. So imagine it's a crowd and they're all watching you. And I offer you $100 and you have to share it with the person next to you. And you say, would you like to take $70. And the person says, well, I'm not sure that's fair to you, but if it's okay, yes. But then everyone else sees that. And now they all have an opportunity to pick who they're going to play with next. Well, you're not going to get picked, picked last, are you? Remember what you told me? You didn't want to get picked last, right? I did not. Okay. So what you did was you turned yourself into an athlete. A machine. Okay. Always get first. <laughs> okay, great. So, but imagine we expand that game. Yes. And we say, you want to be the person that everyone wants to play with. Yep. Well, then all you have in your whole life is invitations to play. Well, how, how, and how are you going to be that person? Be productive, straightforward, mm -hmm. generous. Make everyone else better around you and they're going to want to play with you. A absolutely. So there you go. And then you get to play. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, how is that not the best possible deal? It's yeah. clearly see. So, so the re if if the ethical argument is put properly, it is by far the most compelling argument. It's like if you want to have everything you could possibly want and more, then be a good person. Mm -hmm. The better a person you are, the more likely that is to happen. That doesn't mean you that you're completely protected against getting cut off at the knees, but there's no better strategy. That's it. And you can even think about it selfishly. And I talk about this to some degree in beyond order. Let's say you, let's say that I, you want to be selfish. You think that's the best possible strategy. Mm -hmm. Why should I care about others? Okay. Let's say you should only act in your own best interest. Well, then it's like, well, what's your best interest? Well, what does interest mean? And what does you mean? Mm. What's in your best interest? Your best interest. Three mysteries. What's your, what's best, what's interest? Okay. Well, there's you. But you aren't just you right now. Mm. You're you and you tomorrow and you next week and you next month and you in five years and you in 10 years and you when you're a pensioner. You're a community of selves mm. stretched across time. And so if you were enlightened and selfish, you would act in a manner that would benefit that entire community across time. 
And I don't think that's any different than acting on the best possible part for other people. I, I think they're the same problem. Yeah. So I think as soon as human beings discovered the future, we, we, no, we were no longer singular individuals. We're instantly each a community. And then the community ethic prevails. And the community ethic is, I want to win in a way that makes you win. Mm -hmm. That's the best possible victory. If I win and anyone be... else wins, then what's the point? Well, you think it's a zero-sum game. It's either you or me. Or maybe I want the comparative status. But I would say even if you want the comparative status, let's say you just, you're just you motivated by that. What, what would confer upon you, even hypothetically, more status than to be the most popular person while being chosen for games? I mean, you think about, the, just think for a second about right. it, because it struck me, that biogra biographical uh -huh. um, piece. Alfred Adler, who is the psychologist that I talked to you about earlier, he said, one of his claims was that many people have a, like a, a stark memory that mm. sets the course for their life. That's true. A few right? moments, and, a mm -hmm. few instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have exactly that. You, mm. So Adlerian psychology would be of great interest to you, I suspect. Mm. Interesting. But, but partly you see what happened was you had a true revelation. Mm -hmm. You thought, I, if I'm being picked last, something is wrong. And that's absolutely right. It's it's unbelievably right. And you played it out first in the athletic domain, but yes. you have to start somewhere. Right. So that's a good place to start. Yeah. Jocko was telling me when we talked this week, he's this tough character, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and he could have, and I'm not telling tales out of school here. He could have been a criminal, no problem. <laughs> And he knows that perfectly yeah. well. And I'm not saying yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that as a slur on his character, partly because I believe the Nietzschean dictum that a lot of morality is just cowardice. Mm. Whatever he might be, he's not a coward. Right. And so, and just because you obey the laws doesn't mean you're moral, mm. just might mean you're afraid. In any case, so the question is: well, what socialized this brute? Well, he was taught in the Navy SEALs. Yeah. Take care of your team. That's your fundamental purpose. Mm. And he noted, and we had a long discussion about this. The successful guys, man, they've you know they've got your back. Wow. Right. They you, you know that them, above yeah. all. Yeah. And if and if 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 you aspire to a leadership position among those brutes, let's say, and you aren't someone they know to have your back they're not following you're not gonna make it yeah uh -uh. you're not gonna make it what is the what are the uh. keys to building confidence when you feel insecure afraid or or scared of being embarrassed whether it be dating someone or career or anything what's the keys to building confidence so that you're attracting well, what look, you want look you i read some of your biographical history before we talk today and you tell a story about being picked last mm -hmm. and then you compensated for that yes now there alfred adler by the way the psychoanalyst the associate of freud built his whole theory around compensation of that sort inferiority complex plus compensation but it's adaptive right like you got picked last it embarrassed the hell out of you yep so what did you do you decided that is not going to be me never anymore. again Right. Never again. Okay. Yes. Now you did say, you know, that you adopted a maybe too, what, inflexible model of what it meant to be masculine as a yes. consequence. But when I read that, I thought, yeah, but still you, fair enough. It wasn't the, the new you that you adopted wasn't optimal in all possible manners, but it was definitely improvement over the previous <laughs> you. Exactly. I wasn't picked last again, that's for sure. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. Okay. So, so, so the first thing I would say is that if you feel insecure and less and ashamed and all of that, that you have to take stock. Mm -hmm. And look, I have an exercise online at selfauthoring.com. It's there's three exercises there. One helps you write about the past, one about the present, and one about the future. The present authoring program helps you assess your faults and your virtues. Okay, well, if you have some faults and you feel 
insecure and inferior because of that? Well, you should. Now, it shouldn't be so much that you're crippled by it and unable to take action. You shouldn't be beating yourself into the ground because you're not everything you could be because no one is. And if you beat yourself into the ground, then you can't get up and improve. But you, 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 you have to differentiate. It's like, okay, to what degree am I being hard on myself? counterproductively critical, hearing the voice of my too harsh and angry father in my head, right. um, adopting inappropriate stereotypical representations of masculine competence. How much of my self-criticism is ill-advised? Fair enough. And you want to deal with yourself with a certain amount of care. But then along with that, there's the, well, fix your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're ashamed of being ignorant, you're showing up at a party because, you know, you claim to knowledge that you don't have and someone exposes you. Well, you can be angry at them and you probably will, but they've actually done you a favor. They pointed out an inadequacy is a pathway that you can travel down, Ooh. right? A recognized inadequacy is as soon as it's such a gift in some sense, if, if it's accurate. I'm in it because you think, well, what should I do? What should I do with my life? That's a real complicated question. Right. Oh, here's an inadequacy. Excellent. You have, a, you have a, a goal now. Rectify it. Now, you still have to think strategically and figure out how to rectify it and do it step by step. And, but Carl Rogers, the psychotherapist, um, pointed out that the per person for, for therapy to be successful, the person has to want to change. So they have to have recognized that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. If the if someone is mandated by the court to attend therapy, it's very difficult for the therapist to convince them that they have a problem. Once you're convinced you have a problem, it's like, away you go. You know, I know it's still technically difficult. It requires discipline and all of that. There's no magic solution. But if you're plagued by feelings of inferiority, you should rectify the most obvious inferiorities. Right. Focus on those first over optimizing strengths, would you say? No, not necessarily. Not not necessarily. I'm, and you don't have to redress every. Like I can't. I'm a terrible jazz musician. <laughs> you know, it's and not a, it's not an it's not a thing where you hold shame around or like. Well, it's not an impediment. Yeah, yeah. I would say that you have to rectify an in inadequacy when it's clearly an impediment to your goal, or you have to shift goals. But if you're shifting goals because of an inadequacy related impediment, then you have to ask yourself: Are you is your desire to shift the goal reliable or are you just taking the easy way out? Right. You can protect yourself by, by picking a different goal that's more difficult. That, that's a good mental hygiene practice because sometimes you should switch goals rather than rectifying inadequacies. But you can fool yourself then and, and that's, a, that's not good. And, and if someone is goalless, lazy, unmotivated, not sure what they want to do. What would be a few key steps to get started to, to turn their life around or to find the motivation for something greater than where they're at? Well, I, I think a fair bit of that's probably to be found in, you can find it in shame. Mm. You can find it in guilt. You can find it in conscience. You can find it in anger. You can find it in interest. And, and, and engagement and beauty. There's lots of pathways. If you're angry about something in the world, well, you know, that's an indication that that's in some sense your problem, right? It, it's speaking to you in a moral sense. This shouldn't be that way. Well, maybe you're the person who should do something about it in some manner. Maybe it'll take your whole life to figure out how to do that. But it's bothering you for a reason. So, that the negative emotions can be a pathway to transformation. I'm not trying to romanticize them. They can crush you completely and leave right. you with nothing. Yeah. Right. Uh, for sure. And they can go badly astray, but shame. That's a good one. What am I ashamed of? Well, can you fix any of that? Because you might ask yourself, let's say you're so ashamed and so crushed that you're nihilistic and you can't see any hope for life. You're just done. You might think, well, what if I was less ashamed? Mm. 
like, I'm not going to jump off the bridge today. I'm going to wait a year. I'm going to not, I'm going to work on these things that I'm ashamed of and, and just see, like, does my life improve enough so that I'm not so bitter about it now, or I'm not so hopeless about it now. And my experience has generally been that that works. It works. And then some of, some of its practical knowledge too. It's like, you can get a really long way with very small changes, incremental changes. Yeah. Micro habit changes. So aim low. Don't have big, big goals or big transformations. Well, you can, but, but the problem with a big goal is that it's daunting enough so that it might paralyze you. And there's a high probability of failure. And so imagine that you're your own child. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now imagine you love this child and you would like him. We'll say him because it's you and I talking to succeed. Now, you have an ideal for this child. You'd like him to grow up to be the best he can be, better than you, Mm -hmm. the best man he can be. That's what you want for your son. If the good part of you is talking, you definitely want him to be better than you are, but you want him to be the best he could be Mm -hmm. if your vision is unclouded. Okay, but then you offer him a goal. It's like, well, do this. Well, can he do it? Well, if he can do it without a second's thought, there's no challenge in it. There's no developmental Mm -hmm. impetus. It's not in the zone of proximal development. You want a goal that you can do, but that requires some improvement on your part. Mm -hmm. Because you want to attain the goal. That's satisfying. But then you want to make yourself into the thing that can attain goals. And so you want to push yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to, to push tra- yourself you to a bit far. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and, and there, there's an ample psychological literature that suggests that that's where maximal motivation is to be found. Interesting. So you're, you're pursuing a goal, but you're also pursuing the goal of transforming yourself at the same time. You're doing both of those at the same time. Do you need to know that you're transforming yourself in order to attain the goal? Or do most people just think, I got to take these steps to make it happen, but they don't realize they're becoming better human beings. They, it depends on what you mean by realize. They, they, they have the sense of satisfaction and confidence that would indicate that, although they might not be able to make what that means explicit. But I would say it would be better to make it explicit. It, mm. it adds one other dimension of possible motivation. How do you think people lose confidence? We're talking about gaining it, but how does someone... How could someone like yourself, who's accomplished so much, who's got millions of followers, who, you know, is financially successful, has a great marriage, how could someone lose confidence once they've built it? Illness. Hmm. That'll do it. That's one way. Uh, Death of someone. Hmm. Loss. I mean, there's lots of ways of having the rug pulled out from underneath you um, moral error mm-hmm. um, as the stakes get higher, as we already discussed, the consequences get larger ingratitude. Mm. That's a big one. Um, uh, you can succumb to the temptation to believe your own egotism. That's a big mistake. Um there's lots of ways that things can go sideways. That's for sure. So it sounds like, you know, we, we start off with a lack of confidence when we're pointed at you're inadequate in this thing. And we go down a journey of, you know, building ourselves and overcoming the challenges and diving into the fear to, to have these small wins to build confidence. And then the more successful we become, the more we succumb to <laughs> losing that confidence again, uh, when a lot, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily that you become more susceptible to that. Um, but you asked, how can that happen? How can that loss occur? I think, I think I still believe that, you know, genuine accomplishment, but it's ethical. It's always ethical accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that to be the case. Genuine ethical accomplishment is the best source of security, but it's not un unerring. When you mean ethical accomplishment, do you mean doing something good, right? Mm-hmm. Whether people know about it or not, just good and right for yourself. Is that what I'm hearing you say? 
do, or does someone else need to acknowledge that this was good and right? Um, I, I think if, if you, if you've done it for yourself, that's good, but if yeah. you do it and other people are in on it and, and along for the ride, that's also good. And sometimes that's better mm-hmm. to bring people along. Um, if it's just a matter of them acknowledging it, well, there's value in that too. I mean, you know, you, people say, well, you shouldn't care what people think of you. It's like, well, yeah, of course you should. Psychopaths don't care what people think of them. Now, you shouldn't care so much what people think about you that you're willing to lie to maintain whatever it is that you think they value. Like mm-hmm. there are places beyond which that becomes counterproductive, clearly. But of, of course, well, I mean, I read the comments in YouTube particularly, and I pay attention to them. And if, you know, 30 people say something like, here's something I do, and I probably did it to you. Um, when I'm interviewing, I interrupt more than a certain percentage of my audience would like. I get, that's my comments. It's like, just let them speak. You interrupt too much. So I just try to shut up more now. Do you know the joke? What's the joke? Knock, knock. Who's there? The interrupting cow. The interrupting cow. Moo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a stupid joke, but... <laughs> It's a stupid joke. Anyhow, so, you know, I read those and that's what people think. And, and then I, I think, okay, I should probably try to interrupt less, but I get excited. And, and then with Zoom, there's a lag and it's, uh, yeah. that makes it harder. But I do pay attention and you should pay attention, I think. You work out every day, you haven't missed a day. I do it for the last 20 20- 20 years, years of my life. 20 years? Or did 20 say two years. years? No, 20 some years of my life. 20, every day you work out. So I used to take one day off a week. Uh huh. I used to take one day off a week. For the body recover, right? Makes sense. But that one day off was an active recovery day where I would get on a trainer and ride for like two hours. Wow. But at a, at a zone one heart rate, very low heart rate, and I replaced the carbohydrates in my body while I rode because the best way to recover for me is to do something at a very low heart rate because therefore your blood's flowing through your body. Yeah. As your blood's flowing through your body, refuel it with the nutrients because then your blood's flowing, the nutrients is going through all your cells in your body. All that glycogen is now flowing at a low heart rate. So it's not burning it, it's refueling it. Yeah. So every Sunday used to be that. And it kind of snowballed into, as human beings, we believe, like to, so many people, before I give them a workout plan, they're talking about recovery. Everybody, everybody that hears me speak, they want to go straight to recovery. Work out first. Huh. Work out first. <laughs> before you talk to me about recovery. How to recover, yeah. Work out first. We are always looking for, like whenever I talk to people, people take my words and they, and they, and they put it in a way to where they want to feel comfortable. This guy... You know, they, they, they want to put you in a box. They want to put a title on you. No, you're putting a title on me to make yourself feel better about yourself. If you read this book of mine and you see where I came from, this person was, this, this person was not built. This, this, this person was not made by God. Mm-hmm. This person, sorry, this person was built. I made this person. I made this person by diving in to the insecurities that life gave me. Because now they're yours. They're yours to own. If you're not smart, call yourself dumb. It's okay, because you are. But take that now as you're putting yourself down. If you're fat, call yourself fat. I used to be 300 pounds. Mm. We, we want to talk so soft to ourselves. We're looking for that recovery day. And that recovery day is everything in your life. Everything in your life is that recovery day. We're looking for it. It's not coming. It's not coming. Mm-hmm. Get over that recovery day. And that's the mentality I took with me. And what happened through that process was all the frivolous things of life started to float away. I used to tell people lies so they would like me. Mm. Because I was so insecure. When you start to build yourself up and start to have the one thing that we don't have is confidence. Real, authentic confidence from hard work. Everything else goes away. You, You no longer look to other people for your self-esteem. For validation. That's right. For, yeah. You now know. 
I walk in the room now and I know the hours and years and decades I put into David Goggins. That's something, it's not on the wall. It's not a trophy on the wall. It's not a medal around your neck. It is actually a feeling in your heart. And people go, why don't you ever smile? I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do have a stoic look on my face. I'm a, I'm a very focused person. But the feeling I have in my soul and in my heart, that's why I don't need to smile. I don't need to smile. I don't need you to look at me and say, oh my God, you look happy. Because half of us aren't happy. Mm -hmm. we're, we're giving you something that we think you want to see. I don't do that anymore. I don't care how you perceive David Goggins. Because through my journey, I figured out the one piece I was missing. I thought it was cars. I thought it was women. I thought it was money. I thought it was money. I thought it was everything. The one piece I was missing was me having the courage to face myself. Mm. And once you do that on a daily basis, it's not about the running. Where people are going to be just about working out. Where I got my work ethic from was the hours I had to spend learning this. When you sit down and you're not smart, and you have a disability, yeah. and you still want to be at the mm. top of your class, I didn't want to just get by. When I realized that I can learn through hard work, and I can beat the valedictorian in school, but I got put in 10 hours more mm -hmm. a day than he does. You know what kind of strength comes from that? When you're sitting down, that guy that, that valedictorian studied for an hour, and you know I caught you. I caught you, and I am dumb but I have the work ethic to catch you. That's where David Goggins got really invented. Yeah. Was at a kitchen table with 20 spiral notebooks that were empty. And then three months yeah, later, down. Yeah. they were full. And when you can go through that, I still have them in my storage unit. You go through these spiral notebooks of your life and you realize this is how I learned. This is unbelievable. There's no miles. It's not about the miles, it's that having a discipline every day to say, for me to learn this one math problem, it's gonna take me 10 hours. Wow. And that's where it, and you realize through hard work, you can do, you can outwork anybody. Mm -hmm. No matter how badass they are. But that's the part people don't want to yeah. dive into. Yeah. When someone's lacking confidence in themselves, what's, right. what's the answer you would give them if they're like, how do I gain more confidence? It starts with yourself, man. You gotta start diving into those things that you are afraid of. You don't gain confidence by going to the spot that makes you feel good. It's gonna be a false reality. And the second life gives you that challenge, all you wanna do is go back to what made you confidence or, 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 or what gave you confidence is that happy spot. No, what gives you confidence, what gave me confidence was spending years at a kitchen table trying to learn how to read and write on my own. Realizing I can't learn the way you learn. Mm. I can't, but I can learn. What gives you confidence not being afraid is overcoming the fear. I used to stutter severely bad. So right now, I don't know how many people are gonna watch this. Mm. You know what gives me confidence? Is knowing I no longer care <laughs> if I sit and start stuttering to you. Yeah. That's what gives me confidence is facing these things, overcoming them. And maybe not overcoming them every day, but facing them and facing them and facing them pretty soon like this. You know what, man? This is where it's at. Mm. It's not in that comfort zone. It's in the discomfort zone is where my confidence is getting built. Mm -hmm. That's where it's getting built. But people want to, and they want an easier answer. Yeah. There has to be an easier way. There's not. I'm sorry. I searched for it my entire life. <laughs> you cheated. I did. You lied. I lied. I did everything. And I still felt empty. Mm -hmm. I coach a lot of people nowadays, billionaires, who call me on the phone and say, man, I'm still missing something. It's because they did what they were good at. And they had this beautiful family, two, three houses, cars, everything. Has everything in the world. On the outside looking in, like, my God, man, how can you be unhappy? I walk around with a backpack with all my stuff in it right, and no right, car. Right. And I walk around, happiest person in the world. Have nothing. Happy as hell. It's because I found out the whole key to life. It's not in all that. You have to face yourself. So many people live to be 100 years old and they die miserable having everything because they never examined. I call it my live autopsy. Hmm. You never examine this. Happiness, peace, 
enlightenment. It's all up here, man. It's all up here. If I start talking like this, people go, man, you know, uh, I don't know. It's the truth, man. Yeah, it is true. It's yeah. all up here. <laughs> you just got to be willing to go and face it. And that's the hard part. What's your biggest insecurity today? I, I'm Not to be arrogant, I don't have one. What was the last one you had and when was that? The last one I had was probably um, still me. Me, still living, because I, I always talk about, I, I pay rent. So we, live, we used to live in a $7 a month place when I was growing up. Is and this that, in Buffalo or is this? This in, is in Indiana. Yeah. So like we had a lot of money in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And when my mom left my dad, we went to nothing for a period of time before she got on her feet. Right. And that seven dollar a month place used to be it was my it was who I was. I was no one. I was in the sewer. My mom went there. I had nothing. And you always feel like you have nothing. I had, I had achieved so much. I was a Navy SEAL. I'd gone through Ranger School. I've gone do Delta Force selection training. I've I, I done so much. I, I run 200 miles, pull-up records, everything. Learned to read and write, became pretty intelligent. And I still was like, man, what is wrong with me? It wasn't until I got real sick, and I talk about in the last chapter of that book, I got real sick, and I was about um, 38 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 43 now, and my life got real quiet. I went from running 205 miles in 39 hours to I couldn't get out of bed. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. But once again, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Why is that? In that moment when my whole <clears throat> life changed, I went from a guy who worked out every day, trained every day, to a guy who couldn't get out of bed. My life was taken from me. The one thing that kept me going was my training. Now you was, didn't have that. I didn't have anything. Now you just had to sit alone. Alone. And not train. And that's, that's what changed me. And wow. that's when I realized I hadn't thought, hadn't taken time to think about what I'd done in my life. You hadn't reflected yet. I hadn't reflected. I'd done all these things, but there was no finish line. I still believe that, but you must have time to reflect. Yeah. I was just going. I wouldn't even, I finished the race of life and I wouldn't even receive my medal. I'd go on. <laughs> You're like, on to the next. I'd get in the car and I'd go. You wouldn't even take the medal. Gone. Don't care about like, it. Like, I'm not gonna waste an hour no. sitting around for this ceremony. Most people it's sit soft. around and that's what they like. <laughs> they, they need the ceremony if I accomplish something. The validation. I haven't done anything. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started, that's right. When I started figuring out life, that I was leaving so much in the tank, I call it my 40% rule. Yeah. I was leaving so much in the tank. Once I realized, my God, man, I was this dumb, fat kid being bullied and now I'm a 180 pound person, lost 106 pounds in less than three months. Learn to read, learn to do this, learn to do that. I was like, I need more. Mm -hmm. I was fueling my mind with everything. And I never took time to say, my God, you came from this hell and you're here. So those insecurities, and this is how I explain it the best way. SEAL training became pretty hard and a lot of guys weren't getting through it. So they designed a SEAL pep prep program. Mm. Like a boot camp for the boot camp. That's right. Yeah. And it was two months. In my last two years before I retired from the military, they sent me there to train these kids. Wow. To get ready for 18, butts. 18, 19, yeah. 20 year olds. Yeah. Young kids. So when they get to Navy SEAL training, man, they were physical studs. They were running, swimming. I mean, they were, they were hybrids. Wow. But they get to buds and the same amount of people would quit. Why is that? This is why. We were training bigger, stronger, faster quitters. Hmm. It's not about. Not the mind. That's right. We weren't diving into the sewer. Everybody's got a story. We don't share it on social media. We share our nice life on social media. We, have, we all have a dungeon. I'm just willing to talk about mine. Yeah. Most of us aren't willing to talk about it. I'm willing to talk about my dungeon. I wasn't getting into the dungeon of these guys' minds. I wasn't building that so-called mental toughness. Mental toughness isn't something that you sample. It's something that you live in every day. So when something hard would happen to these kids, like in Hell Week, it would draw on something that made them very insecure and they look for comfort. Whenever hardness comes, and you don't know what it is, it may be different for you than it is mm -hmm. for me, but you go back to your insecurities 
And then when you go back to your insecurities, you then look for comfort within those insecurities. And we all look for that cookie that your mom used to give you right. when you were sad, yeah. when you were sick. We look for our wife or our husband. We look for comfort. It's in those moments you must retrain your mind mm. to think differently in hell. I wasn't training them to do that. Why weren't you training them? I wasn't training myself to do that because at that time, I was doing what I was told. Mm. These guys need to meet a standard. Physical standard. A physical standard. <clears throat> the physical standard is not what they need to meet. It's a mental standard you must meet in life. So going back to when I was sick, I was hitting the physical standards. I wasn't meeting the mental standard. The mental standard is you must know how far you've come. Wow. I wasn't, <clears throat> I, I had come 8,000 miles from where I started. But if you never know that, you're still in the $7 in the a month place. When I was sick, I was able to slow it down and reflect back on my entire life. And in that bed, when I thought I was dying, because that story is long, that, that sick portion of my life is long, I didn't care if I died or lived. Because wow. I was, for the first time in my life, happy. Wow. And at peace. Because I reflected back on where I started. You said, wow, I have come a long way. That's right. And no one saved me. It wasn't like someone came down here and guided me through life. When you figure this out on your own, the amount of pride and dignity and self-respect you have. That's why I walk around the streets with a backpack <laughs> and just like, I don't need anything else. Yeah. You figure it out by going inside yourself by callousing over the victim's mentality. You're always a victim, even if you have everything in life, until you realize what you've achieved. You have to first realize what you've achieved, and my mom has accomplished so much in her life since my father, but she hasn't done that one step. Really? She doesn't acknowledge it and reflect She back. continues to go back to the dungeon of her past life. And live in that space. And live in that space versus live in the space that she's in now and reflecting back on, my God, this is what I've done with my life. So. Have you talked to her about this? We talk about it all the time. And you have to be willing to go there. You have to be willing to really go there. Not, not surface. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't live on the surface of anything. Yeah. Surface is what got me where I was at. It got me from 175 pounds to 300 pounds. Telling everybody I'm good. I don't, I don't give a damn. I'm good. No, they're, they're hollow words. Mm. A lot of us speak in hollow words. I used to speak in hollow words. I don't do it anymore. Everything that comes out of my mouth has substance. It's real. And we all have these feelings in our bodies, in our minds, in our souls. I act on mine. A lot of us who are afraid of something, we allow our minds to choose the path of least resistance so we go a different route. I'm afraid of something is telling me you must do this that. thing. You must do that. Yeah. You have to go that way. And <clears throat> most of us don't understand that mentality. We go left and we wonder why we haven't fulfilled something in our lives. It's because we continue to take the journey that is mapped out. And how I look at it is I, I, I talk in life like a lot of us in life want to take the four lane highway that has road maps and all this other stuff on it, man. It tells you where to go, gas stations. The next 10 miles up, you're gonna see a McDonald's, mm -hmm. a Cracker Barrel. Yeah. It's the easy route. That, Very few of us wanna to go to the right side. That, when, cr that Cracker Barrel's that Midwest life. That's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> I'm from Ohio. It's so all about I, it, man. It's Indiana, Cracker Barrel, yeah. Cracker Barrel everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's amazing, bringing back memories. Um, this is powerful, because I've been telling people this, I've been living that way unknowingly my whole life of like, whatever the thing is I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I started doing those things. Right. And it was just like, I'm sick and tired of feeling afraid. Right. So I need to do the things that scare me the most. That's right. Uh, you know, I, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Tiffany's heard me these, share these stories, but I was afraid to talk to girls when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I was afraid of uh, dancing. I was afraid of like singing and playing music in front of people. I was right. afraid of all these different things. And so I said, I want to do this. I'm going to give myself a challenge every single day until the fear goes away. That's right. And I feel like that's what more of us should be doing. I'm hearing that that's what you, how you live your life. That's all it is, man. <clears throat> and it helps me feel so much more confident. When you overcome that fear yep. of saying, this doesn't have control over me anymore. That's right. 
it's like you can be at such more peace. It's a hundred percent in your life. Most of like like for instance, I never thought in my wildest <clears throat> dreams I could be a Navy SEAL. It's until you open your mind, open mindedness creates that. We all shut down our mind. Like for instance, when, when I broke the pull up record, everybody around me who heard the pull up record was four thousand and twenty pull ups. That's the first thing they did. Oh my God. Four thousand and twenty four hours, or was yeah, this, it's yeah. four thousand twenty pull ups in twenty four hour period. Yeah, yeah. The first thing I did versus closing my mind to like, oh my God, that's crazy. I went and got a pen. You say, how many is that every minute? Exactly. Every, every hour, every second. Instead yeah. of taking life and making it out to be this grandiose thing, start breaking it down. Start breaking it down. And most of us, we live in a box. And we don't want to go outside that box at all, ever. Outside that box is all these possibilities of life. What we do is we shackle our mind. We are a prisoner in our own mind that this is all I can do. This is all I'm good at. And we, we, we take away the possibilities of you could be this, you could be that, yeah. you could be all these things. Mm -hmm. And I never thought at 300 pounds I could be Navy SEAL. Wow. So if my mind was shackled, me and you would never meet. There'd be no book. Right. There'd be no book. Right. There'd be nothing. So. What people understand is that they live for themselves, not knowing that you have the power within yourself to change millions of lives yeah. by facing life, by facing yourself. And through that, I, I would die never knowing that I had the power to change millions of lives. And what haunts me the most, people ask me, what, what haunts you the most? What haunts me the most is that if I would have died at 300 pounds, let's say I was 75 years old, I got to heaven, and God has a chart like that on everybody's mm -hmm. life. <clears throat> God knows all. Let's say that. I don't care what you believe in. It doesn't matter. I'm not judging anybody. But let's say my thing is God. You get to heaven. I'm 300 <clears throat> pounds. I sit down. I was a cockroach terminator my whole life. And we're sitting down just like this. You're God and I'm David. And he gives me that chart. And he says, look at this. And I'm looking at this chart. And on the chart it has all these different things. But my name's on it. But these things aren't me. I was going to change the world. I was going to, mm. I was going to set records. I was going to be a Navy SEAL. I was going to be all these things in the military that I accomplished. You're going to get the VFW award. You're going to be honored here, honored there. And I'm like, God, I was, this isn't me. Like it says, David Goggins, I was an Ecolab guy. I sprayed for cockroaches and I'm 300 pounds. It said here, I'm 185. It says here, I got a, a, a bachelor's and a master's. It says all these things. And God goes, no, that's who you were supposed to be. Wow. My biggest fear in life is if there is a final resting place in this world and there's a final judgment and you talk to something much bigger than you. I don't want to sit down and have a conversation with someone with something that says you're in heaven. This is what you should have been on earth. And are you really in heaven now? Or are you in hell? Mm thinking about how much I left on the table for fear, for not willing to go over the wall and over the next wall and over the next wall. So in my mind, I believe that. And God knows all. At least I believe that. I want God to be up there right now as we're speaking, writing stuff down, saying, my God, he exceeded even my expectations. Wow. That's how I live my life. I now know that there is no cap on the human mind. There's no cap. We cap it ourselves. Wow. Is there a cap on the human body? That's right. Is there one? There, <clears throat> I, <laughs> I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. Because one thing I found out was I didn't, for several years I gave myself a way out. When you were 300 when I was, pounds? When or I was 300 or pounds, when I was, all the way up until I was 24 years old. I would climb a mountain, I'd fall back down. i start climbing, i fall back down for the first 24 years of my life. I went to my first hell week, my second hell week, and then my third hell week came in SEAL training, and the CEO, Captain Bowen, looked at me. I'm on crutches, I'm all jacked up. He says, hey, this is your last time you're gonna go through buds. This is it. I had several stress fractures. I had double pneumonia, I was jacked up, and he gave me a few months to heal. He said, this is your last time going through. I shouldn't even let you go back through. Wow. 
I started <clears> Navy <throat> SEAL training with stress fractures. Stress fractures, That's not shin splints. That's hard to finish. Stress <laughs> fractures. Starting the hardest training, arguably the hardest <clears throat> training in the world with stress fractures. And this is when I started to not put a cap on the body if the mind is there. Every morning I wake up at 3.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, go to my dive cage, go in there before anybody saw me, I get duct tape and I would tape from my forefoot all the way up to the mid of my calf and I would put two black socks on. And so I ran not using <clears throat> the pivot. Oh my gosh. And I ran my hip flexors. So for the first 45 minutes oh to an hour, gosh. I was in absolute excruciating pain. But what motivated me through that whole process was the fact that this kid came from that. I'm in the hardest training in the world, in the worst shape of my entire life. What if I can graduate amongst these studs? Wow. All these guys around me are studs. They're stallions. They're gladiators in my class. They're all healthy. Most of them. They're not broken like this. They may have some, you know, everybody's sick going through that yeah, training. Yeah. But if I can graduate, it would change everything for me. If I can start the hardest training in the world, broken, and graduate. So my mind fed off of that. You are now, from the weakest man, you are now the hardest man to ever live. If you can do this. <laughs> if you can do this. Life is one big mind game. Yeah. And you're playing it with yourself. Is it true? I don't care. It got me through the hardest training, starting out broken. Mm. Where most people quit, I had just started. Wow. And when you take that mindset and you learn to flip that around, that's what made me powerful. And my body followed. And three months later, my stress fractures were healed by running on them. <laughs> it's calcifying it, just like. I never had them since. I'm 43 years old. Wow. I ran 7,000 miles in 2007. Haven't had a stress fracture since. And I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying that when the mind and the body connect and you, didn't, and you don't give yourself a way out, the only way out for me at that time was death. Wow. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. Or I'm going to die. Or I'm going to die trying. Yeah. Period. And my body said, roger that. We're going to get you through this. <laughs> so when the mind gives it no way out, no way out, your body says, okay, okay, I believe you now. I have to heal. I'm going to figure this out with you. We're yes. going to do this. It's going to be the, the worst part of your life, but we're going to, you're going to survive. We're going to survive. Wow. And as you hear in that 100-mile race I did, I started figuring out more and more and more and more about at the other end of suffering is a life that no one, and I'm not talking about go out there and kill yourself. Don't take these words and flip them and yeah. say, oh my God, no. <clears throat> it just be uncomfortable. I call it Don't suffering. Don't physically injure yourself. Yes, not saying that. And then be out for six months. That's right. That's no good. That's no good. I'm not saying, I'm not saying do what I did. Yeah. I was in a spot that life forced me. I had a choice. I had a choice to be this guy or the guy that's in front of you. I had choices. I chose this path. And you're still choosing it. And I'm still choosing it. You can go back to that guy no, any moment. Because I found out. I found out something with those stress fractures. I found out something through facing all these things. I found out a whole nother world, which is why I walk around with all my stuff in a black backpack. Wow. I found out a whole nother way. A whole nother way of no matter how far you get in life, you have to be able to go back to scratch in your mind at a moment's notice. You can never get so far beyond scratch. Mm. What that means is, when you accomplish something in life, if you want to go back to scratch and go back to that $7 a month place where I once lived and visit that place for a long period of time, if you were here, when you went back to scratch, you would now be here. Mm. Scratch is what makes you better. Scratch, friction, obstacles create growth. There's no friction when you're this far up in the game anymore. You think there right. is, the real, achieved, that's yeah. right. When you achieve so much, the friction is, is, is minor. Because why? I'm sore, I'm gonna get a massage today. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat today. Mm -hmm. The refrigerator is always full. 
So your comforts are now, so your discomfort is now very minuscule to your discomfort back here in the $7 a month place. So you have to go back to the total discomfort to then raise your level of where you're at now. Mm. I'm not saying stay there and stay there. Visit. Visit it. And then you raise your level. Take a day trip. That's right. Yeah. Always take day trips. Yeah. How do we train ourselves to find motivation and not be lazy? Because I feel like there's a lot of laziness out there or there's moments of motivation, but then it falls back into a laziness uh, structured schedule. How do we train our minds and our body to be motivated towards a goal and not stay lazy? Yeah. Uh, well, at first it's know thyself because we all, we're all different. So one of the attributes I talk about in the book is discipline. And what I had to do with discipline was um, actively separate discipline from self-discipline. What's and, the difference? Okay, well the difference is that self-discipline is internally focused. Okay, self-discipline is about, is about managing oneself and it, does, it has very little to do with external requirements, right? So, so you or I can decide to get in shape, for example, and we can change our diet, we can work out every day. The external environment uh, doesn't have a lot of say in that, you know, in, 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 us, in us achieving that accomplishment. So self-discipline is, is about managing the internal. Uh, discipline, the way I, I talk about it in the book, is about achieving that long-term goal. This is the, these are those long-term goals that are going to take a, a while to achieve, and the, the external world has a say. So getting that promotion, writing that book, becoming the famous singer, becoming Navy SEAL, right? The external world has, mm -hmm. starting a podcast, right? The external world has a say in whether or not you do that, and that's and the discipline that is required to move through those wicked, those wickets takes adaptability, it takes flexibility, it takes the ability to not get seduced by the highs, the successes, and not get crushed by the failures, and, and continue to move towards that goal. And what I found was, because I'm a, I'm a very unself-disciplined person, I don't really? have a lot, right? Um, and so what I, so I, I had to separate this, because I've, I've been able to achieve a lot of goals in my life. I said, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is um, if you are overly, so, so those with very high self-discipline sometimes, this is not exclusive, but sometimes have trouble achieving long-term goals because, because the achievement of long-term goals often takes uh, an ability and, an, an, uh, and by necessity to march into the unknown, into uncertainty, which is going to throw you off routine and throw you out of certainty. The self-disciplined person, the very self-disciplined, likes routine, likes certainty, right? That's how, it's structure. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so moving towards a goal like that takes oftentimes uh, being able to adapt out of structure, you know, and say, well, I, I can't do that. Like I'm normal, I'd have to just go in, I have to go in unknowing, right? Now, the, the best, the, the most successful people are the, those who have both self-discipline and discipline, right? Um, in terms of staying motivated for a goal, the way I would do it by knowing myself is I would, I would, uh, understanding I'm not a very self-disciplined person, I would simply try to chunk a goal into smaller pieces, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, want to, if I want to lose weight, you know, then I, I can say, well, that's why cheat days are actually good for me, right? Yeah. Because I can, I, can, I can say, okay, I'm going to take this piece of it and, and move. So I, 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 I chunk my reward system in a different way. But I think, um, I think the, way, the way one stays motivated towards a goal is highly subjective, but it, it would, in my... Uh, kind of through my thought process and my experience involve a an active or one to actively um, map out a reward system that helps someone move sort through of, that. Sort of creating a reward system first for yeah. the for the goal in order to help you stay motivated. So depending say, on yeah, depending on your depending on your how you show up. Not right? just yeah. say like okay, I'm gonna my goal is to achieve this thing. It's gonna take me three years to accomplish it. Right. And that's the only reward I'm going to get in that's those right. three years. But how can I reward myself every day for an action I take, every month yeah. for a milestone, every year for yeah. getting closer? So focusing on the reward system. Yes, yeah. and that, and this is this is this is neurobiological mm -hmm. because dopamine, the neurotransmitter, is you get you get hits of dopamine when you as a reward when you achieve things. Yeah. You know, there's many ways you get dopamine, but one of the ways is when you achieve things. So if you're able to effectively create a reward system that means something to you, mm -hmm. it can't be it can't be kind of inert, right? So so if I want to run if I want to run a marathon and I haven't and I can barely run to the to my mailbox, right? <laughs> um, 
you know, then maybe, you know, buying some running shoes and putting them on one morning is enough of a reward system to get a dopamine hit. Yeah. As someone who runs, you know, somewhat frequently, and I, you'd probably uh, identify with this, uh, just putting on our shoes one morning is probably not going to give us that dopamine hit. We got to, we got to extend that, mm. we got to extend that task a little bit so if that you've that, already accomplished a lot of something. So that, you yeah. have to push beyond. You have it to push bit. beyond it to get that that reward system. So it becomes subjective. What would you say? Twenty years as a Navy SEAL at different levels, uh, and you were deployed how many different times? Are you allowed to talk about that? Well, you know, I mean, thirteen and some change. Yeah. So deployments between what six months and over a year. Yeah, I never did year long, but anywhere between you know, three months to six months usually. Um, and this is Iraq and Afghanistan. For the most part, yeah. And other places, maybe you're not allowed to talk about. Yeah. What would you say of that 20 year experience was the most challenging experience for you? Was it something within uh, a mission? Was it learning how to develop as a leader? Was it having a relationship with your wife during that time? What was the most challenging point yeah. for you? Yeah, the most challenging thing ironically wasn't the job because you because we were all so prepared for the job and mm. you were around, we were around just the best people in the world. Um, so, so the trust and the camaraderie was to this day. You know, I, I look back on it very fondly. Right. Wow. Um, so the, not the day to day job. No. You mean even yeah. just like the 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 missions you went out on. Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't challenging. Uh, I think I think if I were to if I were to say, you know, the first foremost was probably having to leave the family. When you have to say goodbye to your family um, for a stint, you know, mm. whether it's three months or six months or some some folks are deploying for a year, right? Um, that is a rough deal that not many people can can capture. Not many people with families can capture that when you have to say goodbye to your kids and your wife for that, you know, you know okay, well, see you in however. And then, and then to add on to that, understanding their stress, or at least my kids were a little bit smaller, but understanding my wife's stress, knowing that I was going someplace and she, it she was dangerous. Yeah, with well, you. I mean, luckily with today's technology, contact was fairly easy, but we found was, you know, again, ironically, we found that, that um, daily contact was never a good idea because what happens is you establish a routine. You get comfortable. You're... You get comfortable. So, so something happens. I'm, I'm working. I'm, I'm overseas in something. I'm, I'm, I have a mission that goes long or whatever, and I don't get to call her that day. Well, suddenly she's worried, you know, and it also makes time actually seem slower. Interesting. So, yeah. So we, we decided we were only going to talk usually once a week. My son, who had a real trouble, I mean, he was young. I mean, he was, you know, he, he was born in um, 05. So he was, he was, by the time he was two, he was, he was having trouble with me deploying. Um, and, and every time I went, it was rough on him. And we actually, for him, we actually almost had to, well, we literally had to de just decide not to, I was not, not going to talk to him on the phone. It was too hard for him. He had to basically kind of forget me. Oh, my gosh. Know, um, so he had to com compartmentalize as a yeah. child. Yeah. In order we to had to help him compartmentalize. Survive. You know? Yeah. And not so, go depressed or yeah. be stressed, because that's one of the attributes you talk about is compartmentalization. Yeah. How do you do that if you're an emotional human being that's you have these deep connections to your family and friends? How do you just detach in a sense? Yeah. And become more machine-like <laughs> for a period of time, yeah. and then allow yourself to feel deeply in other moments. Well, it never goes away. I think the attributes, the, the, the way I talk about compartmentalization and the attribute is more, uh, in, is more kind of surrounded by the way our brain functions and processes information versus I'm going to block something out so I don't have to think about it. However, um, I think most team guys, SEALs, spec ops guys, have a, a very high ability to compartmentalize away from things, you know, block out things that are, mm -hmm. that are painful. I know that about me. Um, and I know that about my my uh, my buddies um, because you have to because war sucks you know yeah. and, and at the end of the day the mission has to be accomplished you know so if something gnarly happens on a mission um, you can't sit there these these movies that show these extended scenes of people you know mourning when when their buddy goes down or whatever like you oh my god yeah you it don't have that happen. no you don't have that time you know you you have to the, the, you have to win the gunfight, right? Because if you don't, then all of you won't make it home, right? right. So, so you have to, and I think, I think the training allows you to do that. The training is so intense and so um, kind of uh, so effective that it requires you to compartmentalize. You know, training teaches you to compartmentalize. You become, you become very, very good at it. Um, now, that can be a detriment in a relationship. <laughs> so uh, I think those of us who were able to recognize that actively try not to do that with our families um, and so it becomes much more of a precision tool versus a, a frenetic 
thing yeah. that just it happens without us without us having control over it. What was the the moment that was the scariest for you when you were deployed, where you thought like um, I may not make it, um, or our team may not make it, or this is a really bad. I guess you're training for bad situations all the time. Yeah, but was there ever a moment you were like, I don't know if we're going to get out of this? No, I was I was fortunate not to have that moment. I That's say nice. that I say that with immense gratitude because I know there's a lot of friends of mine who didn't have that that uh, can't say that they had those moments where they you know they said that. But but no, I I was fortunate enough to be um, always in a position, um, and my team was always in a position that we had prepared, planned, and executed in a way that was highly effective so that when things went wrong, because things always go sideways, um, we had complete, you know, or near complete control, or we, we understood the pathways we needed to get to, to go throughout of it. But, but I say that also, you know, this, is, this comes back to compartmentalization. You know, um, one of the things that you have to be able to do when, when shit goes sideways is to not focus on that thought you just brought up, right? The focus is not, oh my God, I don't think I'm going to get out of this. The focus is, how do I get out of this? But the, so the mental acuity attributes, which are situation awareness, um, uh, compartmentalization, task switching, and then learnability, right? Um, so that's how information is coming in, how we're processing it and prioritizing, how we're switching between the necessary tasks, and then how we're learning from our from our from from our decisions, right? So I talk about the parachute malfunction in in the context of that. Um, but ultimately, comes to, to even be able to do that in the first place, it requires a, a a forebrain dominance in the sense that you're not letting your autonomic system take over into a mm. fight flight response, and you're able to think through stress, challenge, and, and, and uncertainty in the, in the sense of say, okay, what what can I control right now? And this is where trust in your teammates mm. comes in because now I have a team. I mean, I I can say this with with um, with great pride and gratitude. I, I can remember literally walking in areas, you know, when we were overseas and thinking, man, this is a, this is a bad area. Sketchy. Right? This is sketchy. And having complete and utter faith, right? Because I just, I was around, because I was with my teammates, right? I was around people who just, I trusted. I knew that if something went went wrong, we'd, we'd be able to handle it, you know? And so I think that's that's a necessity when you do this type of type of stuff. When you're going out on a mission, What's the process like of preparing for that mission? Are you planning more for all the things that could go wrong and how to get out of that situation? Or is it planning for, here's exactly how we would like it to go right, <clears throat> Yeah. but let's also have a exit plan or a plan for yeah. when things go wrong. What do, it's, how do it's you It's the latter. It's, 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 you plan the mission as you'd like it to go. Um, and then you, uh, inside of that planning, you put together, you build contingencies within each uh, within each factor. So when this doesn't go as planned, right. so, what are the three ways to get yeah, out? Yeah, so so you know, just like I mean, just like any um, uh, athlete would understand, or so so a quarterback coming out of a snap would say, well, I have two or three or four plays I can fall mm -hmm. back on, depending on how this line shapes up, right? Um, you have the same thing, you know. I you know, this is where experience matters. You do you do it over and over again. So okay, well during. As we're coming in on insertion, you know, we, there's there's a few things that could go wrong. So if this, then that. If this, then that. And you kind of do that throughout a phase, throughout the phase planning. Um, but then there's what we call the 80-20 rule, and that is you you get to 80% of certainty, and then you recognize that 20% is just out of your control. And that's where confidence comes. You say, hey, if something happens outside that 20%, we will we will figure it out. Figure on the it fly. out. Because we're not going to figure out everything. And and it's you know Murphy's law will dictate that something happens that we haven't thought of. Uh, so you uh, so you prepare yourself to deal with uncertainty. How do you train your mind to deal with chaos in the moment so that you don't freak out and freeze up, but you actually turn on a level of focus and attention towards achieving that goal? Yeah, the uh, I, well, so I think we're predisposed uh, each one of us to what uh, what I've called like a human Huberman and I both have called this is the autonomic set point. You know, at what point do we start flipping into an autonomic, into an autonomic response, into fight flight, where our, where our system starts, you know, taking over and our forebrain starts coming offline? If we were, if you and I use boiling point as the average, most of us might be average. There are those who uh, who start really freaking out at like 190. You know, so 212 is the average. At 190 degrees, they're starting to freak out. Right. There are people who take it takes till like 230 to boil. To, to yeah, boil, yeah. right? I think that the Guys who make it through that training are predisposed to have a higher set point, first of all. Uh, in other words, we tend to, when bad things start to happen, we tend to slow down and start thinking through it um, versus get all hyped up. 
it's funny. It's funny. You know, uh, I live in a neighborhood, and, and in my neighborhood, there's four other Navy SEALs in really? the neighborhood. There's you know one across the street, one down the road. One. That's pretty nice. Well, it is nice, you know, <laughs> a because they're great dudes and it's great they're great neighbors. But I remember my wife once saying, you know, she said, "Hey, I'm so glad these guys are here and I in the neighborhood." And I was like, "Why?" So she said, "Because if something went wrong, I know I could go to them and they'd act like you act." Oh. And I said, "Well, tell me." I said, "Because because if something happens, they would immediately calm down and they'd start working the problem, right?" And so so I think there's there I think we show up predisposed. Mm. Um, training to it is is difficult you know um and i i think so so here we're actually working on some stuff some stuff to help train have to help teach people to to do that uh but it comes down to understanding your own neurology and it comes down to understanding that you know um here's how you have to think through situations under stress and then it's going to be about putting yourself into deliberate stress to practice that you can't practice this type of thinking if you're not in stress you need to put yourself you you need to put yourself in that what are some things civilians could do to practice stressful moments on a daily basis where it doesn't hurt them, but it's actually preparing them. I talk about every day I think you should be experiencing some type of pain, something that's uncomfortable, Right. seeking discomfort, Yes. uh, whether it be through a 10 minute workout, whether it be through a longer run, it doesn't matter what it is, Mm -hmm. an uncomfortable conversation. We should be doing this every day in a, in a a structured environment that allows us to grow. Yes. What do you think are some ways we could do this that's not putting us in harm's way or physically hurting ourselves? Yeah. I, I can't answer that because it's so subjective. Mm. I can give some ideas and you just gave some. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> some people are, are very social people. So starting a conversation with a stranger is Easy. a piece of cake, right? Yeah. For me, that would be hard, right? Starting a conversation with a stranger would be hard. So that might be something I do. Uh, giving a presentation. Public speaking for people is tough. So uh, so volunteering to give that presentation is a great way for a lot of people because, you know, you know they that... that, that makes them anxious you know so working out for some is like for some people they've developed a system where that that pain point of working out is something they highly enjoy right, right. so so they're not so they're not, not practicing that. it you know so yeah. um so it so someone should should look at their own makeup and ask themselves what what fright well in fear again it doesn't have to go all the way to fear fear is interesting because it's a it's actually a combination of two things it's a combination of uncertainty and anxiety you can have each one of those and not have fear, right? So if you are anxious but not uncertain, that would be, I have to give this presentation on Monday. I hope it's good. I'm nervous about it, right? That's, you know, but, but there's nothing uncertain about it. It's Monday. It's at 2 o'clock. I know what I'm going to do. I'm just, I'm nervous about it, right. okay? Um, uncertainty without anxiety, well, that's every kid on Christmas Eve, okay? I mean, so, uh, but it's when you combine the two that you start to generate fear. Well, um, the the idea is if you have fear, if you have uncertainty plus anxiety and it start to, to to manifest in fear. The key is to understanding which of those two factors can you buy down. Okay, anxiety buy, buy down buy down, which means uh, decrease. Um, anxiety can be decreased internally. It's an internal response, right? So things like uh, some of the tools Hubert talks about, visual tools, breathing tools. You can begin to you can begin to shift your physiology out of your sympathetic into your parasympathetic, mm-hmm. come off of the autonomic response uh, system, right? So that's so that's how you can start you know kind of buying down un, uh, uh, anxiety. Uncertainty is largely external. Okay, mm. that means something around you, outside of you, you don't understand. There's unknown. Um, the way, the best way to do that, and the way we do it uh, in the in Spec Ops is we we control what we can control. So some some people have referred to it kind of control your three foot world, right? But it doesn't have to extend. It's not a it's not a three foot thing. It's it's what in this moment can I control, and then take control of that, mm. right? Because then you are grabbing onto certainty. You're taking what is uncertain. You're grabbing onto something certain. As soon as you've controlled that, as soon as you move through that. Then you have to make another decision. What's what's the next thing? This is basically kind of stepping through, right? Stepping through this challenge, right? So, uh, so you can start to you can start to practice um, coming off of fear or moving through fear by kind of understanding both of those those uh, those pieces. What do you think is the greatest lesson you learned throughout the twenty years for yourself that has helped you, not only during that but also after being uh, with the seals? I think it's I think it's. It's not fearing the unknown. It's the it's the idea mm. that I, I you know when you go through something like that, you understand that hey I could pretty much do whatever I'd like to do um, and I know that even though even though I don't know how I'm going to do it I know I can figure it out if there's enough interest if there's enough, enough passion right you know I'm not gonna I'm not interested in becoming a pro football player you know right so so that's you know that's off my list right but I was interested in writing a book and that was a whole new process for me you know when I start when I left the Navy I started public speaking I did not like public speaking yeah. at all right <laughs> I did not like it 
but I knew it was a, it was a, it was an edge that I wanted to conquer, you know, and say, okay, well, let me work through the things to to conquer this edge. Kind of like your philosophy. I think it's a really, it's it's not only a deep one, but it's profound mm. because because if we are consistently moving, deciding what our edges are, moving towards our edge, and then getting there. Um, then we are we are growing, you know, because guess what we're doing at that point? We're looking for the next edge, you know, and that's the growth process is continuing to move to our edges and and then finding the next edge. I mean, you say you don't like public speaking, but don't you have to speak to your teams and guys? Yeah, but that's not time. public. That's like, really? you know, that's that's the guys. So it's, it's not it's not different. the same. It's different. Yeah, it's different. There's a lot more, you know, when you're, you know, because you're and, and and when you're in the in the military, there's no there's no expectation of of you know kind of great articulation or or humor or you know just or what's, what's effective like, yeah it's just what's like hey, here's the word <laughs> <All right, laughs> right? and that's what you appreciate too there's like no one wants you to sit there and pontificate it's like hey guys this is this is what's going on um so there's there's a there's a directness that's appreciated and and um and required you know so but that's not you know public speaking. what do you think was the hardest lesson you had to learn through your 20 years something that you were struggling with or challenged with or you kept repeating until you finally Learn the lesson. Yeah, I think the hardest lessons, the hardest lesson, maybe not one, the hardest lessons were just around leadership, what it takes, what leadership take, what, what it takes to be a leader. Because again, um, mm. being a leader and being in charge are often conflated. They're not the same thing, okay? What's the difference? Well, anybody could be in charge. I, as an officer, you know, in the, in the military, I was pretty much in charge of something all the time. It didn't, didn't make me a leader. You, you don't get to call yourself a leader. It's like calling yourself funny or calling yourself handsome. Okay, <laughs> someone else, someone else makes that decision. You uh -huh. can't, you can't, you can't designate yourself that way. Um, someone else decides whether or not you are a leader. Okay, and that's done through the way you behave in that position. So if you are in charge and you're behaving in a way that causes someone to make a decision, okay, this is the person I would lead. I mean, if 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 we think about the leaders in our lives, the people who we consider leaders in our lives, it's not because they were just in charge of us. In fact, we could probably think of people who we would follow. Uh, into hell and back, and they're they have they have no place in the hierarchy of, li of our lives, right? They are just someone who just they behaved that way in a, in, a, in a way that's made us kind of in, in in endeared to them. So so the attributes I talk about in the book, in terms of leadership attributes, are all attributes that actually um, cause behaviors that typically cause people to look at others as leaders. What are the behaviors that? most human beings admire the most that we want to follow that person or be inspired <laughs> to be led by something that they're sharing or involved in a community a movement whatever it may be what are the three or four main behaviors that they have and we should be developing if we want to be better leaders yeah well i talk about five in the book in terms of the efforts the first five. is empathy okay and again i would say this there's not an exclusivity in terms of what someone will decide uh, because there are people who will look subjective, at it. Subjective, right? It's a subjective thing. You know, again, it's, it's someone's choice as to whether or not they think. So empathy is one. Um, selflessness uh, is another. And, and this is not just, um, you know, so let's just back up here. Empathy. Um, not just I know how you feel. I feel how you feel, right? I can, I can put myself into your shoes. And, and, I re and that reflects in the way I, I communicate with you and I, and I care about it. It shows that you care about another human being. Um, what, is, what is the best way to, to show that? I mean, give me an example. As opposed to saying, I know how you feel, how do you feel empathize showing you feel how they feel? Well, first, deep listening. And so, so, uh, so, we all, so listening to another person, but, uh, but true, like deep, full on, like listening. Like I, I am hanging on every word listening. Oftentimes we listen to people and we're two things, one, or, one of two things is happening. Either we're thinking about what we're gonna say next, right? Or we're thinking about how what that person is saying relates to our lives, and it's not from a malicious standpoint. It's it's really because we're trying to relate. So we're trying to say, okay, you're, you're talking about football. I'm thinking, okay, wait a second. You know, did I play? I played football in eighth grade. Maybe I could talk about I'm that. Relate, right? yeah. yeah. But what I'm doing is I'm not listening to you anymore. You know, I'm making uh. what you're saying about me. You know, so um, so what what deep empathetic listening is? I'm I've I have like a whiteboard in my mind. Okay. And as I'm listening to you speak, if something pops onto the whiteboard, I erase it <laughs> and I move on. I just keep on listening. You know, that is, if you do, if you, if you empathetically listen, like look into someone's eyes, attentive behavior, facing each other, you are going, they are going to feel cared for because you're exchanging. Now there's an exchange going on. There's serotonin being released. Uh, there's, uh, mm. there's oxytocin being exchanged or at least released. Um, and all these uh, kind of these bonding chemicals, right? So, so that type of listening shows someone you care about them. Empathy is a little bit tougher for some. Some yeah. people are just wired, we know, some people are wired to be, my wife is extraordinarily empathetic. I mean, she really feels other people. I mean, I am not. She's, I've had to, I've had to really 
try to develop empathy. It's something that she's taught me in terms. She hasn't taught me. She hasn't taught me how to do it because you can't teach someone attributes. But she's inspired me to kind of develop it myself. What is the opportunity? Well, the opportunity is to unlock the power that's inside you to create a better future for yourself, for your family, for your body, for your mind, for your spirit, for this country, for this world, for your community. Yeah. I always, you know, I always talk about since I experience many breakdowns, whether it be a physical breakdown or relationship breakdown or family breakdowns, I feel like in order for us to really see clearly, we need to break down in a big way. It's hard to make big changes when things are good or when they're so-so. It's, it's even when it's like, ah, it's not good, it's, it's really, it's hard to make changes. It needs to be devastatingly challenging for a lot of us. Some of us maybe can make cha uh, changes all the time, but for most people, there needs to be some devastation or near devastation, either personally or close to you to say, oh, let me reevaluate, let me pause, like you talked about, and start creating a better future for myself. Why do you think that is in human beings that, you know, if things are going bad, we won't change. If they're going good, we won't change. But it's almost like we need a massive breakdown, near-death experience, divorce, COVID, for us to see clearly to start changing. Well, there's a really simple answer, patterns. So the thing about all human beings is that we are pattern learning machines. Mm -hmm. And if you feel stuck or broken, I guarantee you, while you feel that way, you're not, you have a pattern of behavior or a pattern of thinking that is broken. Mm -hmm. And we need to be disrupted because we love our patterns. And even people that I know, like I've even when we're in your pain, show, even when we're in pain, we love well, the pain's familiar for a lot of people. Yeah. So a lot of people, like you may be listening to Lewis and I talking and you grew up in a super chaotic household. Maybe your parents argued all the time. Maybe your dad or mom were in and out. Maybe there was a lot of fighting. Maybe there was actual abuse. I don't know what was going on, but it was chaotic as hell. And so as an adult, you have vowed to yourself, you are not going to repeat that pattern. But what ends up happening is because as a little kid, you observed, witnessed, absorbed the pattern of chaos in your nervous system, unless you go about the intentional work mm -hmm. of breaking the pattern of chaos, you will create it in your own life because it's what's familiar. You won't understand. Why do I keep dating these why do I? Why do I go to these bosses that treat me like crap? Because you don't know what it feels like to be in a relationship with either a boss or a romantic partner or a roommate that is consistent because for the first 18 years of your life you lived in a in a state called when's the next shoe gonna drop right and so wherever it is in your life that something is broken there is a pattern that you don't see yet that is making you continue to stay in a broken situation. And so one of the things that you just asked, which is why is a perspective change or losing a job or something like that that's so disruptive because those sorts of things, COVID-19 breaks every pattern. Yes. Black breaks Lives Matter. Yeah. Yes. Black Lives Matter breaks patterns of thinking that you weren't even aware that you had about privilege or being anti-racist or what your black colleagues and friends and relatives deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so having a breakdown is one of the biggest things on the planet because what you get is you get a break from your own bullshit and you can look objectively at where you are mm. and for the first time look ahead and say, well, what do I want to go create? And nine times out of 10, if you're discouraged right now, if you've got financial devastation, if, you've, if you're facing something that is making this moment in time as hard for you as life was for Lewis and I in 2008 during the last recession, I beg you, ask yourself honestly if what you had is actually what you wanted. Mm. The thing that you just lost, that, that job that you bitched about all the time. That relationship the, that was yeah. bad to you, yeah. Yes, or the friends you can't hang out with because it's convenient and you can't, you're in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Like actually ask yourself if this is what you wanted or were you just used to it? Mm. Being uh -huh. used to something, Lewis, I think is the biggest reason why people don't change. 
I asked my mother, I love my mother. I love my parents. I've been married 51 years, which is a feat because they were, my mom was a teen mom. But uh, I, I asked her once if she'd go to a personal development seminar with me. <laughs> What'd you say? Are you kidding me? Why would I want to change at my age? Oh, wow. I might discover I hate my life. Wow. I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave that right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I think being yeah. used to what you have. I mean, I, 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 I even our son, our son is, so I'm, I'm here in Vermont at my mother-in-law's place and our son is going to go to high school in Vermont. And so we're going to kind of split our time back and forth between my mother-in-law's place and our place in Boston, because God knows what business is going to be like. And, you know, why would you need an office after COVID-19? Right. Another amazing thing to realize, um, even that change, I notice my own agitation, my own anxiety coming up. Will I make friends? Will I like a slower lifestyle? Hmm. What happens if Chris likes it up here and I hate it up here? My own mind because it's not something I'm used to yet, is making up stories to cling to the old way of life. This is a moment in time, everyone, please. This is the greatest gift. The greatest gift is this moment of pause where you get in touch with what you actually want. And if you don't have the skills, for crying out loud, look around and take an online course because if you need skills, to prepare yourself for the thing that you want, get them right now. Yeah. What is the thing you really want then? You've gone on this uh, oh. grab chase of opportunities that have come your way, not in, a, not in a bad sense, but it's like here are a way for you to share a message and be on thousands of stages and do a talk show. And, you know, it sounds like it was your part of your dream, but it was it your was it a dream of like, wow, this sounds amazing or is this is exactly what I want? Because I remember, well, I, I remember yeah, you texting me uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, saying, I'm working on the deal with Sony. It's I think it's going to happen. And then a couple weeks later, it's happening. And then I see all the announcement. It's exciting. You know, I had a talk show yeah. on Facebook for a little while. Yeah. It's exciting stuff. And then you put your whole life into one thing and then it's over. Now you have transcended where you were before because of the skills you acquired and the opportunities you created for yourself and you've sharpened your coaching abilities and on camera stuff everything has gotten better but how do you you know what do you think about that well so let me back up three years ago when i was last on the mm -hmm. school of greatness i had just published the five second rule book your support was was life-changing lewis like you literally were the person if I had shimmy down into the kind of barrel of a cannon, you freaking lit the match and shot me <laughs> I don't off, know man. about that. You did. A, oh, yeah. You were oh, crushing yeah. it on your own. Don't worry. Well, so I, you know, since then, what I, what, what has happened, and this is one of the things that I have, I have reflected upon mm -hmm. during these last 10 weeks that I've been off the road and I've been working from home, which I've loved every single second of, um, Everything that I have done since, since we launched the five second rule book was in reaction to things that were coming to me. So I never sat out and said, Hey, the five second rule audiobook has been a complete, uh, like record breaker. We clearly have an audio audience. Let's go pitch audible. Right. Audible came to me, which is fantastic. Um, I never, I, I always dreamt about having a talk show, but I wasn't out pitching one. Sony, came to me. In Big. fact, the only reason why we got into courses, online courses, and we now have more than a half a million people that have taken our courses wow. online, um, was because Success Magazine came to me and wow. said, let's do a course together. I remember, and I was there interviewing you for it. <laughs> oh, I, was, I hated it. Because <laughs> what I discovered is I hate being told what to do. Mm. And so, but that gave me the idea, oh, we should do courses ourselves. And so this pause has made me stop and go, well, what do I really want to do? And the, the truth is I want to go and make the biggest possible impact that I can. Mm -hmm. And I want to collaborate with more people yeah. and I want to do events. Um, and I, I don't want to be the CEO. I'm a terrible leader, horrible leader, <laughs> the worst actually. Um, because I'm, 
amazing at coaching. I'm amazing at uh, creating. I'm amazing at reacting. I'm terrible at managing people. I'm terrible at managing a project. I have ADD. I have dyslexia. Um, I'm a bulldozer when I get anxious. Mm -hmm. um, I hate similar, people. Mal. I know we are. Like, That's how we like, yeah. <laughs> we'd kill each other if we were roommates or business partners. But but Who I think understanding right? yourself is really important. And so there's a couple things that I've decided. Number one, I'm going to consciously create the next chapter. Yeah. And what is that? And I'm um, well, I'm still in the middle of doing it. Yeah, but you want to do I, events. You want to do these things you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, and I want to I want to collaborate more mm -hmm. with a wider audience of people. Mm -hmm. And I want to build a brand bigger than Mel Robbins. Yep. I don't want it to just be me. I want to build a platform based business yeah. that uh, reaches more people because yeah. here's the thing that has got, that got me through kind of the loss of the talk show and the way that I think about things that I hope helps um, if you're listening yeah. and you're kind of struggling with something. Um, I believe, and I went into the talk show saying this to myself, because there's a 99% chance based on the history of people that have tried to have a daytime talk show that it was going to fail. And I went in there saying this, I'm not doing this because I expect to have a successful talk show. I'm going to put a thousand percent into it so that I have no regrets and I wouldn't change a thing, but I'm going into this because I know that there is a skill a person or an experience I am meant to have that will help me for the next chapter that I can't mm -hmm. see coming. Mm -hmm. And the experience was number one, meeting Mindy Borman, who um, is my executive producer, now my business partner and CEO. And it was also in working with a team of 130 people and finally being in the right seat on the bus, Lewis. And not having to manage everything, but being in your lane. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and having being, a team and you not being the one doing everything. I know that feeling. Well, it's not even that I was doing everything. It's that I didn't have anybody managing me. Right. And so your and, mind is going to go into like opportunity, 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 as opposed to focus mode. <laughs> right. And so if you ever wonder why it feels like we're running in circles, it's because I'm the one leading us in circles. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and so it's a very hard thing to spot when you're in the middle of it. Yep. But when I got into a machinery that operated in a way where I was in the right seat on the bus, it was absolutely liberating. And that was the biggest gift of all. And then the third thing is, I think the, the daytime talk show and being face to face with your audience and having such a big daily audience, um, it was really amazing to be able to have an impact on a large number of people who feel forgotten because they're a little bit older if they're still watching TV. And a lot of the folks who are still watching TV at home during the daytime uh, do not have the resources that you and I have mm -hmm. and may not have access to therapy or right. live in a community where it's stigmatized. And so having a platform that was reaching people um, that really appreciated this kind of content and also working with a really diverse range of experts, absolutely incredible. So yeah. I felt like I was organizing a killer dinner party conversation every yeah. day with real people's problems and the world's best <clears throat> experts. And so you kind of do a similar thing here on your podcast. So I know I want to continue to do that, but I'm in the middle of creating it. So if yeah, I said right. anything other than I know it's events, I know it's more courses, I know it's collaborating with more people and getting outside my comfort zone. And I also know that as I set out to, to, to write down what I want to do, there is so much freaking fear that I have. Why is that? Because I think, because I still feel like I'm not worthy. I feel like I don't deserve it. Like it's old bullshit. And I think that's the other thing about patterns, everybody, is just because you identify. And for me as a kid, for whatever reason, I have my own version of feeling invisible and mm. feeling like I'm not good enough. And so my way of coping both with my anxiety and being a survivor of sexual abuse and um, 
and wanting love, which we all need, is I was like an overachiever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm the kind of person that's super busy and a go-getter because it got me attention. And if I was the one that was super busy and achieving, I not only got praise, but it also insulates you from other people not picking you because mm. you're the one in a leadership role doing the picking. Right. And so there's a part of me yeah. at the age of 51 that is realizing that, you know, this, these feelings of feeling unworthy and this hyper drive to try to achieve shit, it's all coming from a place of feeling inadequate mm. or like what I'm doing is not enough. And Still, so that's at 50, having the talk show, having a best selling book, having the audible originals, having the platform everywhere, having the impact is still don't feel being the most booked female speaker in the world. Like you still don't feel it's so stupid. It's annoying. And human beings are annoying. We are stuck <laughs> with this wiring. Like if you think about it, like all of the crap you believe is probably a hangover from age zero to 10. Mm hmm that as adults, we walk around thinking the same stuff we thought as kids. And I can't stand that I feel that way, but knowing it, it allows me to catch it before it has me, before it stops me from yeah. having an event or writing that next book or taking a risk. What do you think the biggest fear is? Because you say, you say not worthy or not feeling enough, is that? I mean, it's just people liking me. I think like, a, you know, being a, a people pleaser. Yeah. Um, we're, so, we're so similar in every way. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's great. So um, being, being I, you know, I want people what to like me. You, what happens if I don't like you? Uh, it's lonely, dude. Hmm. What happens, if 90, is, of, what happens if 99% of people like you and 1% doesn't like you? Oh, I don't give a shit about that. Okay. But if it's like, I honestly, if it's 50, 50. I think that the work that we all have to do, every single one of us, whether you bulldoze, mm -hmm. whether you people please, mm -hmm. whether you avoid conflict, whether you're impulsive, <laughs> whether you yo-yo uh, your decisions, uh, whatever it is that is your pattern, you know, you, the, the constant trashing yourself. I think the, the, the journey of your whole life is figuring out how to truly like and love yourself. Yeah, it's the, it's so true. I mean, I remember this was my whole life was never loving myself and needing to go prove to others originally that I'm worthy. This was hap happening in sports and business until I started opening up and accepting myself and, and, and taking off the mask when I turned 30, talking about sexual abuse and, and just kind of saying, screw it. I don't care what people think about me anymore. This pain inside is hurting so much. It's not worth living with it. So I'm going to start sharing and allow myself to heal and allow myself to finally love myself. And it's so funny that we could just write a book with two words that says, love yourself. And that's all the book needs to say, because a lot of us never remember to love ourselves. Remember to acquire skills, which are important. Remember to love other people, remind ourselves to take care of our health. But if we don't love ourselves internally, if we don't think we can give ourselves a hug because we're not deserving of it, then none of this stuff is gonna matter to the point of we're always gonna need to do more to feel something. Right. It's well, crazy. nobody teaches you how to do it. And see, that's the thing. And, and you know, I mean, if you look at, human development, we're the only species that literally can't survive without another human being mm. taking care of you. And so we are biologically mm. hardwired to bond with other people. And that is the very, from the very beginning of when you come out, bonding with somebody else and making sure they pay attention to you is your survival imperative. So you right. are born needing somebody else. And I think what ends up happening is there's never that kind of clean break or pass off between needing your parents to take care of you, needing your friend's approval to fit in, to truly having ownership over giving yourself what you didn't get, giving yourself what you needed. And that's the piece that I've been doing a lot of during wow. the, the great pause is slowing down because so much of my busyness was fueled by, uh, you know, 
praise me, love me, am I doing enough? You know, please tell me I'm doing okay. Okay, I can breathe now, I'm okay now. And when I slow down, and maybe it's a function of the anxiety, that's when things get scary because that's when you've really got to be with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it's in getting off the road, slowing down, recognizing that I'm super grateful for all the opportunity. And I know the work that I'm doing makes a tremendous impact. And I particularly love hearing from mental health practitioners that the five second rule, I've heard from so many people in inpatient psychiatric wards, Lewis, that use the five second rule in the videos we put on YouTube in their group counseling sessions wow. with people. And knowing that it is helping so many people, it is like the greatest gift on the, in, on the planet to know that it's making a difference. But I know that in this next chapter that I consciously create, I want to have more fun. <laughs> I want to, I really want to love the process. Yeah. I don't want to make it so hard on myself and be gripping everything so tight. Mm. And it's really easy for me to see it in other people because I know what it feels like in here. I'm working hard to break the patterns that still hold me back. And the big one that holds me back is um, bulldozing. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. I never had any dreams when I was a kid. Um, I think the area I grew up in, we were so poor, things were so rough, but you gotta remember, that was during the Great Depression in the 30s. I mean, there's not too many people alive that oh, live through that yeah, yeah. anymore. And we didn't have dreams. We just, you, you get by was the deal. Right. Now, when I started to rethink and grow rich, I was 26. That's when I started to really dream. Mm. And what do you think is the most powerful principle in the book? Obviously, there's a lot of them. For you, what's well, the thing that stood out? There's a number of them, but imagination is, you know. And, and I had learned... See, I was studying many things at the same time. Our higher faculties, um, school teaches nothing about them. You can, many seminars don't teach you much about mm -hmm. them. Um, we talk about you becoming what you think about, but there's, you've got to go further than that. Most people live through their senses because we're programmed to do that. Mm. Literally, we're, we're programmed genetically and then environmentally to go by what we hear, see, smell, taste, touch. But you know, I have, an animal, I have a dog at home that can hear, see, smell, taste, touch. All animal life operates through senses. We've been created in God's image. We have these higher faculties. We are creative beings, mm -hmm. literally. We have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. They're, they're the faculties that make us separate from everything else. Like, all the other little creatures on the planet are completely at home in their environment. We're the only creature that's totally disoriented in our environment. Mm. And that's because we've been given the faculties to create our own environment. Right. But we've never been taught how to use them. Now, we teach that in our company. We teach how to develop your perception, the will. You change your perception, you change your life. Yeah. You know, and the will. Um, when John Kennedy asked Dr. Werner von Braun what it would take to build a rocket that would carry a person to the moon, bring him back safely to Earth, von Braun said, he answered him in five words. He said, the will to do it. Now, many people would hear that and they don't really understand what he said. The ability to hold that picture on the screen of your mind and nothing else. Because the will is what gives you the ability to concentrate. Energy flows to and through you. Through concentration, you increase mm -hmm. the amplitude of vibration when the energy leaves you. Um, that's how absentee healing's done. Through the will. Mm -hmm. You know, a practitioner will hold the idea <clears throat> and they'll have the subject relax, be very quiet, they transfer that thought right into the person's subjective mind. And so it affects the body. Yeah. Well, the will is very important. So we've got to understand these things, you know, intuition. I can walk by a person and like I could tell, as soon as I walked in the room, I know exactly what you're like. You operate, you probably studied this, but you operate from almost evenly between the right and left hemisphere of your brain. You've uh -huh. got an interesting mix in your personality. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know that, but sure. you know, I could feel that. Um, 
you're almost an even balance between the two. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I say that, I'm trying to figure out more one than the <laughs> other, and I don't think you are. Um, yeah. Well, your intuition will do that. Because mm -hmm. your intuition is a mental faculty that picks up vibration and translates it in your mind. It's through intuition that you get answers to your questions. Mm. Like you asked a question, the opposite side of question is an answer. It's the equal and opposite side. So our answer comes with our question, but we're not tuned in to, to pick it up. You know, like every question is an answer. Mm -hmm. um, well, the imagination, of course, it's it's everything. Yeah. Um, so you get these higher faculties and you get using them. And I started to learn how to use these. And I started to see that we've got so much going for us that we never hear about. School doesn't teach us. Our parents don't teach us. You go to work for a company, they don't teach you. So the odds of learning it are really slim, you know. And it's the reason there's so few people that really are successful in life. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of material around on success. My goodness, there's, there's more around today than there's ever been. Yeah. Self-help books are, you know, top of the bestsellers list. The crossing, yeah. You know, in, in 1968, when I started, 61, when I first started to study this, you had Norman Vincent Peale's Power of Positive Thinking, you know, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Carnegie. It was a few books, you know, Think and Grow Think Rich, but yeah. there weren't that many. Today, there's thousands of them. Yeah, people need it because they don't know how to use the tools that we but have. But they don't know how to use the information that's in the books. Right. How do we... <laughs> so what, what are these five faculties again, you said? You have perception. Yeah. Intuition. The will. Uh -huh. Reason. Reason. Yeah. Imagination. There's six. Well, and six. memory. Like everybody has a perfect memory. It's just weak. <laughs> I worked with Harry Lorraine, who's probably had the best trained memory in the world. And I asked him one time, he said, Harry, how long do you remember something? He said, still don't want to forget it. Hmm. We had a man, uh, Abdul, over from Saudi Arabia for a, in a matrix seminar that we conduct. And uh, he was teaching, he was a psychiatrist, he was teaching people to memorize the Quran. Uh, Jerry Lucas, great basketball player, mm -hmm. he was teaching people in San Fran to memorize the Bible. Hmm. We have a perfect memory. It's just weak. We never develop it. Right. But we grow up and oh, have such a bad memory. Well, there's sure. no such thing as a bad the memory. The more you say it, the more you're going to convince yourself that it's weak. That's yeah. Exactly, yeah. Which uh, faculty of the six was the, uh, the hardest for you to tap into and, and well, become they're, a master? They're all, they're all difficult to tap into because we're programmed not to use them. Why is that? Because there's only one problem in the whole world, and that's ignorance. We didn't know we had them. Mm. See, people talk about perception, but they don't see it as a mental faculty. You know, it's just a word. Mm -hmm. If I have a challenge, if it's something I'm really struggling with, I've learned how I'll take and I'll write it out on a piece of paper as clear as I can, as if I was going to give it to you and then you'll understand the same as I understand the problem. I'll put it in the middle of a table and I'll sit and look at it. And I'll keep asking, now, is that problem in me or is it on the paper? Is it in me? And I'll work until I get it on the paper, get it out of myself. For example, what do you mean, like a problem that you might? Well, anything that I'm, I'm trying to figure out, maybe uh, how to improve a particular seminar I'm just not happy with. I've yeah, been yeah. doing it for a long time, you know? So you would write uh, down. Yeah, write down the problem any is the problem seminar. you've got. I don't care what the problem is. Uh -huh. Maybe you're short of money. You're not having money. Right, right. Write that down. Right. You know, you, you're short of money for a purpose. You were wanting to buy a building or something. So you look and at the you look at the paper and then you ask yourself, is the problem in me or is it on the paper? And you work until you get it on the paper. Get it out of yourself. Mm. So you can look at it objectively like a stranger would. And then go and sit on the other side of the table. And I may say, now, <laughs> you know, how would Lewis Howes look at this? Yeah. How would he handle this? Mm. I may go sit at the end of the table and literally move physically and say, how would Earl Nightingale handle this? Mm. How would he see this? I may say, how would Napoleon Hill go somewhere else? And they don't, person doesn't have to be alive. They could be dead. Right. Their energy's not dead. It's yeah. always here. And 
Well, what you're doing is shifting your perception. As you change your perception, you eliminate the problem. Mm. The answer's there. But you've got to get in harmony with it. You know? So any one of them, you take any one of them. Um, the will, like we were talking, mm -hmm. the will. If somebody's standing behind you, behind you, let's say in a mall, mm -hmm. and they're staring at you, you feel them staring at you, don't you? Yeah. Why? Feeling is, constant, is conscious awareness of vibration. And when a person's staring, they're concentrating, they're sending such a powerful charge of energy at your brain that you start to feel it. You turn around, sure as hell, there's somebody there staring at you. Concentration increases amplitude of vibration. There's a power flowing to and through us all the time. It never stops. Mm -hmm. You can photograph the energy leaving the body. Well, concentration increases. It makes it more powerful. So whatever you concentrate on, you're giving more energy to. Emerson said the only thing that can grow is the thing you give energy to. Mm -hmm. So as you start to learn how to utilize these higher faculties, you start to learn how to improve the quality of your life. And you start to see why you're God's highest form of creation. You know, it's like I don't see God as a man on a cloud. Right. Just going to answer my questions for me. <laughs> you know, a great author one time said, God will feed every bird, but he's not going to put food in their nest. Mm -hmm. You've got to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, God's not going to do it for us. We've got to do it. Yeah. And so we've got these higher faculties. We've got to learn how to utilize them. Which one was the hardest for you to learn how to utilize? And which one do you think is the hardest for the majority of people? Intuition. Was for you and everyone no, else? No, not for me. Intuition because, for everyone no, else. Yeah, um, because I made up my mind I was going to study that one. I saw <laughs> a guy that was very intuitive and I wanted to be like that. <laughs> and I thought it was, you know, I would have said when I first saw it, he was psychic. Well, the truth is, he mm. was psychic, but we're all psychic. We all psyche are. is just Greek word for mind. And so I was fascinated with what he did. He could just look at you and read the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to learn how to do that. Yeah. So I, I made up my mind I was going to study it. And in a seminar, if I'm teaching this, the one thing everybody wants to know, how do you develop your intuition? Because you can get, intuition is a feeling that you pick up. Intuition reads feeling. Feeling is conscious awareness of vibration. So you're reading vibration. Vibration is the natural law of the universe. Like your body vibrates. Your vibration by high speed of vibration. Well, you've got to take your mind off yourself if you're going to read the other mm -hmm. person's energy. You've got to focus on the other person. So you can't be insecure when you're trying to be intuitive. Oh, no. You can't be doubting yourself. Uh -uh. You can't be lacking something. You have to give all of your attention to the person you're working with. Yeah. And, of course, that's a secret for speaking, too. Mm -hmm. you know? um, most people don't do that. We're, we're more concerned, what's he think of me? Does, he, mm -hmm. does she like me? You know, is my tie straight? Is this... What am I going to say next? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What am I going to say? Am I going to say the right thing? Am I, you know, you got to take your mind off yourself totally and put it on the other person, and you got to be relaxed. Mm. You got to get very relaxed, and you'll Breathe. tune. In, well, you'll tune into their energy. Mm -hmm. You start to feel it. Like if you're with somebody and you say, "Cut, they were interesting." Why were they interesting? Because they were interested. You know, if you want to be loving, be lovable. If you want to be loved, be lovable. If you want yeah. to have friends, be friendly. The most interesting person in the, in the room is the most interested person in the room. Exactly. That's what I always learned. That's the truth. One of the things I used to be, <clears throat> I love everything you're saying. I get so excited. That's why I'm passionate about this because I was telling you beforehand that I was terrified to speak in front of a few people, in front of an audience of three, five, ten. It was terrifying. The idea of being in front of a hundred or a thousand people was like I'd rather, you know, curl up in a ball when I was uh, 18, 22, those ages. And... I remember someone telling me, I heard that somewhere, the most interesting person in the room is the most interested. And I said, that takes all the pressure off of me. I don't have to say anything interesting. I don't have to be like this funny, charismatic. You just have to be interested. Just listen yeah. and ask interesting questions mm -hmm. or ask a, a thoughtful, genuine question. It doesn't have to be smart. Just See, most people, they don't even remember the person's name. Yeah. Why? Because they're not interested in their name. They're too focused on themselves. What does the person think of me? If you're really interested, you're going to remember the person's name. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting? You mentioned there, 
there's a good story that is that about public speaking. I had studied this stuff for a long time, <laughs> and I had used it. I knew it worked. I didn't wonder if it worked. I knew it worked. Yeah, yeah. And all I wanted to do was teach it to other people. It took me nine and a half years to figure out why I changed. And when I learned, all I wanted to do was teach it to other people. But I was afraid. <clears throat> I was very shy, very self Insecure, focused. yeah. Very insecure. Mm -hmm. But I had all this knowledge. I was earning a lot of money. In there, you know, I did well. Outside of there, forget it. And on one of Earl Nightingale's tapes, <clears throat> on the recording, called The Magic Word, on attitude. It's a fun thing. You're familiar with it? Uh -uh. Oh, let's check it out. You got it, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. I will get an original copy and send it. To oh, please you. do. You've got it. You've got it. I'll listen to you. I will send it. Well, he said, now, right, there's an on attitude. He said, now, right here, we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we can do, the goals we can accomplish, and for some equally strange reason, we think other people can accomplish things that we cannot. You just want to realize that you have deep reservoirs of talent and ability within you. Now, hmm. if you had asked me, do you understand that? I'd say, of course I understood. I've listened to it a thousand times, at least. Well, I was in the back corner of the room at the O'Hare Hyatt. Bill Gove was speaking to a thousand people. I was in the back corner of the room. And I was watching him. Bill Gove was the Frank Sinatra speakers. Hmm. One of the best speakers in the world. And I watched him. He came off, there was a thousand people, there were about 500 bank here, 500 here, and then, and then there was a central aisle. He got to this corner, he had a hand held mic, and he had his hand up. And he said, if I want to be free, I've got to be me. Hmm. Not to me I think you think I should be. Not to me I think my wife thinks I should be. Not to me I think my kids think I should be. If I want to be free, I've got to be... And I was watching him and I think, my God, this guy's so good. If only I could do that. I could never do that. All of a sudden, that record of Earl started to play in my head. Now right here, we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we can do, the goals we can accomplish. And I thought, damn, that's what Earl means. And I suddenly realized, and I had been listening to this thing for years, if Gove could do it, I could do it. Mm. And I made up my mind, I was gonna learn how to speak like he did, and I was gonna get him to teach me. Wow. And so he became a mentor of mine. I paid him a lot of money uh, just to sit down and talk to him for a few minutes, a number of times. Now, I speak nothing like Bill Gove. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm nothing like him. He speaks totally different than me. Mm -hmm. Although I'll speak to thousands of people at the same time, what he taught me was to be relaxed in front of the audience. That was the big lesson. Mm -hmm. If you're not relaxed in front of an audience, the audience will know it. How do you relax in front of an audience when you're terrified? You've got to think of the audience. You've got to think of how you're going to, what you're helping, how you're going to teach them something. Uh, another mentor of mine a couple of years ago told me very something similar because I was, I'd been training in Toastmasters and had coaches and had overcome a lot of my fears of speaking in front of big crowds and you know, I got pretty good. I was getting paid you know, big fees and things like that, but I was still nervous a little bit before and felt a little insecure. And I remember calling him about 15 minutes before being like, can you give me some grounding? Can you give us some coaching? Mm -hmm. And he said, don't make it about you, make it about them. You're gonna mess up, be okay with it. You're not gonna remember every word you wanna say, mm -hmm. don't beat yourself up. Focus on them and how you can serve, don't focus on yourself. And that's when everything started to shift. Just like you said, when yeah. you focus on service to the audience. You gotta fall in love with helping that audience. Helping, giving, uh, doing whatever you can to serve, you stop worrying about everything the way you look. It's the same thing when you're having an interaction with a group of people and you're just listening and you're not worried about what people think about you. You're just being interested in them. You gotta have a very confident feeling in what, about what you're doing, you know. How I, do people build that confidence if they don't have it? Well, you build confidence by learning, don't you? I mm -hmm. mean, that's the only way you get confidence. Yeah. I went to a, a nightclub in London, England back in the 60s, um, the talk of the town. It was the largest supper club in the world. Mm. 
and the show they had was the Wild Wild, the Wild West, Wild Wild West. And it was like a Vegas show, and they'd bring in, that show may run for two or three years, and they'd bring in the stars to work it. And I went one night, and I had a seat right by the stage. It was a thousand, they, they'd set a thousand people down to dinner mm, in the talk wow. of the town. It's not open anymore. Wayne Newton was the star. Wow. Wayne Newton was a kid. He was 20, maybe 21. His brother was playing with him, playing guitar in a little group of his. He walked out on that stage, bang, just like that. He owned that place. I never forgot that. That guy was so confident. And he had that audience in the palm of his hand right away. Whenever I go to speak, I will find a place, if I'm speaking to a group, they go in the kitchen, sit down. I've learned if you're dressed, they'll think you own the place. They'll just leave you alone. <laughs> and I'll sit down there, and I'll, I see Wayne Newton walking mm. on that stage as a kid. I thought, that's what you got to do. you got to really fall in love with the idea of helping the audience, and you own the place. You go out, and you're going to be, and deliver. And any time you see a star come out, they own the place when they walk out. But they've fallen in love with helping you. Mm -hmm. you know? Something else, it sounds like you've mastered the power of alter ego. For me, as an athlete, I used to be scared to perform, uh, to play in front of uh, big games. And I used to tap into Jerry Rice because I was a wide receiver and Jerry sure. Rice was you know, the best. And so I was just like mimicking him. I was like, how would Jerry Rice do this? Mm -hmm. how, you know, how did he carry his body, his chest? How did he walk on the field, his swagger, his confidence? Mm -hmm. And I just acted like I was Jerry Rice. I became him mm -hmm. when I stepped on the field and it helped overcome the insecurities of the nerves sure. by just embodying the energy of Jerry Rice. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you've been doing that. I do that in different ways yeah. with different people. Yeah, in uh, different scenarios, right? Yeah, like <clears throat> in, years ago I started to realize the real power of self-image, mm. um, studying Maltz's work. And I will, um, and I've taught this to many people, I will build an image, uh, different parts of my personality, I will see someone that I really, something they do that I really admire, the way they do it. Um, and I will adopt that. Now, I've got this, I, I've been doing this for years, mm -hmm. and if you were to watch me going from one place to another, I never walk fast. Never. When I was a kid, this stuck in my mind, there was another kid, Donnie Miller, lived down the street from us. Mm. Now, this was during the Second <clears throat> World War, so there were no fathers at home. They were always yeah. shooting at each other. And, but his dad was home. His, wasn't, his dad wasn't well. Yeah. His dad had had a heart attack, so nobody went around his house <clears throat> because his dad was sick. They'd come around the other houses. But some, the doctor must have told his dad to walk. His dad was always dressed, suit, shirt, tie, and I'd watch him walk up and down the street. I'd see him every now and then, he'd walk up and down the street. And he had this real relaxed walk about him. And when I was building this stuff in, it's a picture of his dad hmm. stuck in my mind. And so I sort of mimicked his walk, wow. you know. But I've done different things. Like, um, I used to watch Earl Nightingale record. Uh, when I first went to work for him, he had a recording studio. It'd be like this, where there was a window. My office, I could look in when he was recording. And one day I realized, he's talking to that damn microphone. Right. There was a microphone. He was at, and I thought, that microphone's a person to him. Mm-hmm. Now you create all great broadcasters, they just talk to one person. They, they imagine don't say the you person. people or yeah. you folks or <clears throat> talk to you. But they would be talking, and I realized he's talking at microphone. So at any time recording, I talk to one person. It's a microphone. If I'm working with the audience, I talk to one person. Mm -hmm. These are just little lessons that I picked up to get better at what I was doing. I remember. If a person's negative in an audience, real negative, there could be 500 people in that audience. That one person's energy is so strong. It stands out, yeah. And there was a woman that I met, Beverly Lynch, years and years ago when I was at Nightingale, uh, Conant, and I asked her one time, I said, she was the speaker. I said, Beverly, what are you doing? There's a negative person in the audience. She smiled, 
And she says, you talk to the light, not the dark. I thought, wow. <laughs> so obvious, why did I miss that? So if I'm talking and there's a negative or a few negative, I just take one person that's super positive and it doesn't matter where I'm looking, that's the person I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to that person. So you focus on the positive people. Ah, always. Always. Yeah. Never take advice from anybody you wouldn't share places with. Criticism is a form of advice. But you're afraid to tell people how to do stuff. So you just criticize what they do. Some people, and then they get it becomes an addiction for some people. Criticism is not a great behavior. I, I know you've heard the phrase, nobody's doing better than you will ever criticize you.